ethics, but how they present in real practice. Absolutely. And, and I think it's an interesting one. The first time I'd ever been taught ethics was when I studied counselling. I'd never come across it really in my schooling. And um, it, it was, it was, I found it quite fascinating. And ethics is really a branch of moral philosophy. It's about, it's about right and wrong, doing things correctly and doing things incorrectly. And it's really important that as therapists and those people who train, we understand the difference between right and wrong. And some, some of the differences can be quite subtle. And I was thinking about this, but I was thinking about this as I was preparing just to kind of read my opening monologue. And ethics really are like time, Ken. And I'll say why they like time. Because up until about the this the sort of the 18th century, everybody in everybody in the country, certainly in certainly in the UK, had their own time. No one had a watch or a clock. So it meant that everybody had their own version of what time was. It was only when the train started to run that clocks were invented. A bit of a fun fact there. So the trains could run on time. And the same thing really applies to ethics, because if we don't have an agreed um, way of working, an agreed right and wrong, we could become tribal and we might just make our own rules up, which means that clients may, you know, may become um, disadvantaged. So ethics is a universal agreement of what is right and wrong. And it's so important that we understand how ethics fit into our studying and indeed our practice for those who are going into practice. And it's really about how you present yourself in the therapy room mm -hmm. and what guides your actions. If you have to make an action, what guides your actions? Where do you go to to say, I've had this, this presented to me, what do I do next? And the answer is check your ethical framework. Mm. Oh, I like that. What a, what a great way to set that stage, Rory, and kind of lay it out there, looking at where uh, ethics kind of originate, the, the, the seed of ethics being in that moral philosophy. And I think what's important here, we're speaking about ethics in counselling, specifically, we're speaking about ethics that, as Rory has just mentioned, you may uh, see from your uh, ethical body, you know, as a counsellor, as a psychotherapist, when you graduate, you will join an ethical body and there will be a code of ethics or an ethical framework to which we will work. And uh, I guess it differs from profession to profession. So uh, in a previous profession, Rory, I was a full time magician that's what i did i was an entertainer i used magic and illusion as my vehicle for entertainment and we we had a a, a magic club it's called the magic circle uh, i was a member of the johannesburg magic circle at the time and one of our ethics was that we would not reveal the secrets of magic because it protects magic and magicians as a whole now of course that ethic which i hold very dearly and and do to this day um doesn't doesn't uh, show itself in counselling. So it is counselling specific when we're speaking about ethics here, not just ethics in general. I'm using as a reference for today, uh, National Counselling Society, which is a, a ethical body here in the United Kingdom. I'm using their ethical framework. There are other ethical frameworks available and you would look to whoever your ethical body is. And what I like from this is it starts off by kind of defining an introduction of what ethics are. And it says ethical considerations are more than plural pluralistic judgments of right and wrong. I like that. That's a lovely sentence. They involve exploring principles, morals, and values behind a particular intent, intervention, and action. And I think that's a beautiful way of describing why the ethics are there. And of course, I think to go into how ethics may present themselves, I think we start why we have a code of ethics and the code sets out standard expectations for all counselors or at least if you're a member of an ethical body and you're working to that framework you're agreeing to that when you become a member you are putting your signature you are uh, professing that you will follow this ethical uh, framework and I, I guess Rory that's the the basis of the word professional comes from professing an oath and here Ooh. we're professing to uphold an ethical framework and that's why counseling is a profession we profess this allegiance or this following of these these ethics and 
if we kind of know what those ethics are, it stops my judgment or my frame of reference maybe differing from yours, Rory, and you thinking one thing is right in a situation and me going, no, something else is right. So it gives us something that is a standard, something we can look to. If we come into difficulty, we can look to that ethical uh, framework to help us in our decision making. And I think the number one, number one takeaway from ethics is it will look at your fitness to practice your fit, your fitness, your ability to be able to serve a certain client. And I guess it is unethical and it makes sense that it would be unethical to work with a client in an area that we're not trained in, Rory. And I think in its simplest terms, ethics can guide us in, is this client right for me? Or is this client not right for me? And I guess that's a very basic one, but that is a very strong foundation of what the ethical framework is there for. Absolutely. <clears throat> and ethical frameworks are there, you know, to protect clients. You know, we, we speak a lot on the Council Institute podcast about the, you know, the trainee or the, or the practitioner's frame of reference. But from a client's frame of reference, someone who knows nothing about counselling but needs that help, maybe may be desperate for help to try and kind of find the answers to difficulties in their life. When they sit in front of someone, I think there's an expectation that, that person is going to do the right thing he's going to act in a way that advantages the client and helps the client not disadvantages the client and ethics are part of that it's part of making making the client's journey as pain-free as possible but also and i think this is really really important the fact that it gives credibility to our profession the fact that when someone visits a counselor they're not going to go away and say, "Oh my, oh my goodness, that was that was a terrible experience," and I'm I'm not going back there again. They ask me for money, or they they ask me for a date, or something like that. That when they sit in front of someone, they're confident that person is going to treat them correctly. Is going to be very thoughtful, and crucially, Ken is accountable. Is oh. accountable <clears throat> because the reason we have a code of ethics, it's something we sign up to. You're absolutely right, Ken. We profess that we will we will work in a certain way, hence the word professional. You're absolutely correct. But what happens if a client says, actually, that person didn't treat me correctly? They, mm -hmm. they formulate a complaint <clears throat> initially maybe to the organization or, or if it's a private practitioner to the ethical board that they are, um, that the practitioner belongs to. And the first thing, the organization or the, the the ethical body is going to say is how did you use the code of ethics to yeah. to shape your decision and if you say oh well i read it once but i, I don't take too much notice of it you're going to be in some difficulty you're going to be in some difficulty the an ethical framework gives us the advantage and it is an advantage of being able to make decisions based on an external opinion and we can we can therefore um, formulate any responses or, or or look at our actions in through that prism. Very very important. And I want to say one thing about the ethical frameworks. For those of you who are studying, you may have come across the different ethical bodies. That uh, there's no one ethical body here in the UK. There's a number of ethical bodies, and they're all they, they all they all sit under the Professional Standards Authority, which is a government organization which sets the kind of I'm going to use I'm going to use a very simple word, the, the rules of how how professionals engage. And most of the ethical frameworks actually are the same. They say the same thing in different words. They say, it's the same thing in different words. So there's a huge um there's a huge expectation of this is how therapists behave and this is the this is the ethical framework that you look to. And as I said earlier on, if you if you if if you find yourself, you know, in, in front of a complaint, you will have to use the ethical framework to mitigate or to justify what you've done. Yeah. Ethical decision making and, and going to your ethical framework when you're needing to make a decision and looking at what the requirements are, the fundament, fundamental principles of that framework and mapping what your decision is to that protects you. Uh, and it's called ethical decision making. Now, the, the, that ethical framework protects you as a practitioner 
So when you're making decisions within that framework and you're kind of following the framework as a guiding uh, light, as it were, then you are kind of protecting the decisions you make. doesn't mean that the decisions will always be right, but you can defend why you made that decision. But it also protects the client because you, 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 you are informing a client when they kind of present for therapy um, that there is a complaints procedure. And if you're not we should be. This is something that we, if we, if you are a member of an ethical body and you're working to an ethical framework that has a, a, a transparent complaints procedure, which all ethical bodies certainly here in the UK do have, we need to be giving that information over to our clients because we're probably the last people, person that a client will go to if they are unhappy or if they do have a complaint. You know, they're more likely to tell their friends and wanting some kind of recourse mm. uh, for that. So we give that to them right in the beginning. And it's really good practice to make available of the ethical framework to which you practice available for your client. That can be done in an email where you give them a link to a PDF version from your ethical body, or you can print it out and give it to them in your, in your very first session. But that kind of levels the playing field. We're saying the ethical framework is there to protect us, also there to protect the clients. So to, to balance, I guess, the power of counselling, the client should have access to the same information we have access to in terms of the ethical framework and guidance on how they should go about if they do feel that they want to uh, raise a complaint um, a, a, against us. So I think that that is really, really important when we're looking um, at, at how ethics might present in, in uh, practice. Step one make sure that you're informing your client to which ethical framework you work, making a copy of that available and a link uh, if they if they want to go and have a look at that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, Kev. And, you know, one of the things that um, may be in short supply for clients is trust. You know, one of the one of the things that can sometimes happen as people go through their lives is they may become mistrusting events and and. Um, people in their lives may have given them cause to mistrust. So when they go to see a counsellor, there, there could be very strong issues of trust. And Ken outlining what is really good practice to give a client on the contracting stage, the very first session that you, you see them formally, to give them a copy of the ethical framework and link that to a complaints procedure has to some level, I would imagine, uh, you know, build trust because trust is the currency of therapy isn't it if you don't trust someone you ain't going to tell them what's on your worried mind and if you can if you can if you can do that right from the outset you know they say that first impressions are lasting impressions and i think that's a, a pretty good axiom to live by if you you know if, if you're producing this and saying look this is how you can this is you know if you've got a complaint you can you can complain here this is the ethical framework making it all transparent then that will really really go a long way to building trust and most importantly building the relationship which as we know is a huge part a good a good therapeutic relationship with the client is a huge part to the curative factors of people getting a positive outcome in therapy mm, i like that rory and <clears throat> the truth of the matter is when when you know we, we're speaking now about um how theory of applies itself in in practice and we're speaking about those ethical frameworks well how does this appear in our practice the truth is when you are in a session with a client whether that be online or in person in a room um there are three elements to that relationship there is your you and the client that is one element of that relationship also with you in the room in a way is your insurer they're there because <laughs> we have to work to the requirements of our insurer. And if there is a complaint or if something does go wrong, of course, our insurer is the one that steps in and, and, and protects us, our reputation and us financially as well. But also in the room is our ethical body that we uh, kind of subscribe to because we are acting from, uh, um, I guess, acting in a way we should in terms of working within the ethical framework. So in the room is us and our client, our insurer and our ethical body. And if you look to your ethical body, they will give you um, things that you can strive to be, ways of being that we should strive to be. And that's kind of personal qualities, but they will also have definites. And those definites will be, you have to do this. And that would be maybe related to 
the law within where your jurisdiction or wherever it is you practice. So right here in the UK, uh, part of the, the National Counseling Society uh, ethical framework is maintain strict confidentiality with the client counselor relationship. And it speaks about a collection of information online records kept secure and confidential uh, that are on a computer um, in the uh, following the terms of the general data protection regulation or GDPR. So that is very specific to the United Kingdom and to Europe, I guess, Rory, mm. but we're not given a choice here. It is we're told we have to ensure that the client notes and record are kept secure and confidential and that we register with the ICO where applicable if we are storing information online. So you'll get from your ethical framework, personal qualities to work towards and a way of being that we would hope to that would represent that would that would be considered a good a good practice for counselors but there are also parts of the ethical framework which are hard fast you will do this because they're related to the law one of those of course is the breaking of confidentiality you know we, we hold confidentiality as a cornerstone but if we're taking theory putting it into practice there are certain things that if a client mentions them you have to break confidentiality certainly here in the uk because the law requires us to absolutely and you know i like the term framework when i was when i was younger which was a long time ago we used to have something in our local park called monkey bars which was a frame made of scaffolding poles which would be about seven foot high and then internally it had scaffolding poles that made a lot of cubes inside and the children would play inside it. And it was noticeable that the children who played inside it, if they slipped, they'd only fall to the next level and they could hold on to that and, and they'd be fine. But the, the children who played on the outside, if they fell, they fell from seven foot and by gosh, they fell hard. And I think if you want to visualize the framework, it's something you work within. And the nice thing about frameworks is, is that they will, they will, they should hold you. If you do slip, they should hold you. And the framework is plugged in for, for those who practice to supervision. So supervisors should be talking about the ethical framework. So it produces a check and a balance. And, you know, people make mistakes. This isn't, this isn't about being punitive. But sometimes we do things with the best intentions and we find that we've, 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 we're on the outside of the framework we could fall and with that falling we may take our client with us so it's really important that you know we talk about ethics all the time it should be in our conversations as students as practitioners within supervision it should mm. it should be like it should be like a stick of rock you know click the stick of rock up and it should say ethics all the way through if you had a if you had a blackpool stick of rock a counseling stick of rock if you clicked it open it would say ethics in the middle yeah oh very much so if you're outside of the UK and wondering what a sticker rock is, jump, <laughs> jump, jump on on uh, Google and put in Blackpool uh, stick of rock. And basically, it's a it's a sweet. It looks like a stick. Um, it's kind of maybe an inch uh, in diameter. And uh, throughout the whole of the stick is wording. And it will say something like Blackpool or the tourist destination. And yeah. we call it a stick of rock here in the UK. And it's basically the same wording is present throughout the entirety of that suite as the the, 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 the wording of the ethical framework should be present within yes. our practice. If there's a takeaway as we kind of back out of this, it is this. How do, we, how do we take this theory, put it into practice? Well, you, you go to your ethical body and download the ethical framework and look at it again. Print it out, have it on your desk, have it wherever it is that you can look at it on a regular basis and familiarize yourself with it. You know, yes, we're called on to study this when, when we become, um, when, when we're students and we're training to become counselors, but it's good practice to reflect on it regularly and a good supervisor will hold you to account as Rory has just said, and you should be looking at that at the bare minimum a couple of times a year in your practice. Things do change in the ethical frameworks. And also we change as practitioners, you know, there's the general conduct, but there's also ethics that, that uh, um, pertain to certain elements of practice. Like if, if you're doing research, you know, and you might not think of that, you might have a research pro project on and just go ahead with that in your own private practice. You might be researching something you want to write about. Go look at the research ethics from mm. your, your body first. Training ethics. You know, if you decide, you know what, I've got a specialist area in such and such, and, and I trained 
to be a, a, a teacher. So I'm going to offer some training. I'm going to do some CPD. Well, your ethical body should have a section within the ethical framework that covers how we conduct ourselves when we're delivering training. And maybe it's not, maybe it doesn't come to mind naturally. And this is why having the framework on hand and looking at it regularly kind of prompts us uh, to what we should be doing and the different areas that we can map to that framework within our practice. Absolutely. And if you want something on hand to have a look at, I've made a handout um, on the role of ethics and ethical bodies.